a lot of people really feel like you can just continue Halloween into Halloween too and play them together. And but you, you literally do. And that's what I, I wanted to talk to you about that. What's the boogeyman? As a matter of fact, it was. You use the first three minutes of the old Halloween and then there's a cut and it's, you know, Loomis coming out of the house and you you can't bump the audience. Right. So there's a lot of pressure on you to match everything. I didn't you know, it's interesting. I mean, it, it's like I guess I'm sorry to use a sports analogy, but it's so it's like if you follow a quarterback and you're a quarterback and he's either been traded or, he, or he's moved to another team or he's retired or whatever. And he's a legacy. You still have to you still have to go in there and throw. You still have to go in there and play. And yeah. you have to be confident of what you're capable of doing and what you're what you've trained to do and and allow that training to pay off and come off and all of those things. So in a way, you know, I was really lucky in that I felt like John's style that he had established with this kind of point of view and moving camera and all of that, that sort of felt like it fit my strong suit, like it fit my instinct. And I had been a cameraman. And so I, you know, the sense of moving a camera was not foreign to me. And uh, I actually asked them to put the, we were using something called a panic glide, which was Panavision's version of Steadicam. And I said to them early on, put that thing on me so I get a sense of what it's like to operate it and also what it feels like. And that thing, that was A, it was heavy and B, it hurt. I mean, it wasn't custom fit to me, but I mean, I was like, oh, fuck, that's serious stuff, you know? And so interestingly, it made me very aware in my career of what the physical uh, limits of using a Steadicam could be in terms of burning out Steadicam operators. And, um, you know, and having had that experience, when I went to do uh, Bad Boys, at AFI happened to be when I was, before I was prepping, but after I had signed to do the film, uh, happened to be a, a class, they did a seminar on steady camps. And uh, a guy named Ted Churchill was there, who was sort of the preeminent steady cam operator in the country beside uh, Garrett Brown, who had invented the steady cam. So after the demonstration of steady cam and all that, I went up to, to Ted and I introduced myself and I said, look, I'm doing this film. I want it to be highly mobile. It's about gangs. And I like to give you the script and I'd like you to call me and let's sit down and talk about where you see Steadicam being deployed as a methodology. And boy, did that lead to some great collaboration. I mean, if you look at Bad Boys, there's, we did a lot of innovative stuff that hadn't been done. So there's a chase with Sean Penn and, and uh, Eric Gurry uh, escape uh, and, and are running through the woods and all of that. We put uh, a Steadicam on an ATV, all-terrain <laughs> vehicle. That had never been done before. Wow. And you get a nice, uh, smooth, fast shot. Like Yeah. And we did stuff where we put a steady cam on a Western dolly so we could run hard with the Western dolly. And then we'd come to a stop. The steady cam would step off and continue on. And just interesting stuff, you know? Yeah. Um, so to come back to uh, Halloween, I, Halloween too, I felt like I had been handed a little bit of a gift with uh, talented people. The crew was almost ex- all the same except for uh, the production designer in the first AD. Everyone else had been on the uh, had been on the uh, first one, and that was also difficult because I would sort of say, "Okay, here's what we're going to do," and there'd be a, I could sense a little <laughs> reluctance, and then they would say, "Well, John wouldn't do it that way," and I'd say, "Well, let's ask John. Is he here?" Oh, that's right, he's not here. So I guess. Absent his telling us how to do it, um, let's go. Now, Here we go. Let me ask you this. Was that your, you know, young Rick first movie? Was that your attitude? Were you kind of like cocky like that? Like, yeah, John's not here, so. Yeah, I was cocky. I was a quarterback. I knew how to throw the ball. And I wasn't about to be intimidated by people who I didn't feel knew in some ways what I knew. So 
there were some run-ins. Uh, there was a day where I walked onto the set and I said, boy, the back wall looks really hot. And the DP said, well, it's not. And I said, well, humor me, how many foot candles are on the back wall? And he said, six. And I said, I'm sorry, but there's a lot more than six on the, on the back wall. He said, oh, really? What do you think it is? Now, I never worked in foot candles. My light meter when I was working as a documentary filmmaker was mostly crushed. It was a Spectre Pro, but I mean, I always worried that the, that the uh, ball had been, it looks like a ping pong ball had been crushed a couple times. It had a couple of, of uh, folds in it. So I never thought it was that, but you know, I got pretty good because of my fucked up meter of yeah. judging. So I, I looked at the back wall and I looked at him and I looked at the back wall and I said, 15. He went, no way, no way. At that moment, the, uh, the gaffer happened to be walking past the back wall. I said, hey, Mark, um, do me a favor. Just how many foot candles are on the back wall? So he took out his meter and he looked at it and, it, and then he kind of put his meter away and started to walk away. And I said, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. And he said, 15. <laughs> I mean, I was so lucky. I mean, right on the dot. That it, I mean, it gave me a little bit of credibility beyond what it should have. But I mean, there was no denying that that's what it was. Yeah. So uh, on the other hand, I don't think Dean uh, Cundy liked that very much. Mm. He would been challenged and he hadn't won that challenge, you know? And so it created a little bit of, uh, you don't know as much as you know uh, from him to me and uh, you're, your imagery is, you know, it's like there's a scene where Gloria Gifford is, is lying on a table and there's a, a, just a pool of blood and nothing else. And I said, no, I want the, I want the room really to fall off. The, he said, oh, that's so film school. <laughs> I said, I don't even know what that means. All I know is that we're shooting two, three, five and we have a lot of space to lurk. And I want it to feel like Michael Myers could be anywhere at all times. So I want the, the sides of the room to be dark. I think it's such a gorgeous shot. It's like she's floating. Yeah, yeah. It's beautifully designed. And, and that's what you wanted, but he thought you should see everything? Yeah, I mean, he didn't, he didn't like the floating and he didn't like, I mean, it's so dark that every time you look at him, like, it, you know, it, it makes you nervous. And the contrasts and all of these things you're worried is, is he going to leap out of that darkness? Is he in the room? Uh, you know, right. Cause you've um, established that when sometimes when there's darkness, his face will just like slightly right. appear. So right. you're toying with that now, which is yep. great. I just love that the last shot of this, that that's just yep. beautifully composed. Yep. This was coming from my sort of art background. And I'd done some painting also. There was a real sense of that. 